everybody. Welcome to my tech stream. I'm going to be doing a little bit of upgrading on um, I have a A and K PKM. It is an airsoft gun. Um, I'm gonna, maybe if I have time, I'm going to refinish the wood as well. I'm going to stain it purple. Um, on my lap is Gizmo. He won't be here the whole stream. Oh, thanks. Welcome the moustache. Oh god. So Gizmo is going to make my stream life a little more difficult for the first hour or so. How are my sound levels? Are they? Am I too loud? But um, yeah, so I did all the sanding off camera because that nobody wants to watch that. It's boring. Oh, there's ads. <sighs> Stupid ads. How are my sound levels? So I did all the um, sanding off camera because it's boring and nobody wants to watch it. So if we get to that, um, I'll show you how to make a uh, stain of any color that you want and kind of how, you know, how you should stain. Um, obviously you got to do a little bit of prep before the stuff that I'm going to show you, but that's pretty much, you know, you can, you can look up how to sand wood. So this is the, um, the PKM as it stands without any furniture or whatever. So I've never taken one of these apart before, so you can, you might have to bear with me on some uh, some silly stuff. But um, from what I'm led to believe, there's this screw right here, and one of these screws somewhere you take out, and then the whole gearbox comes right out. So we're gonna figure out we're gonna figure out together and come hang out. Hopefully Gizmo doesn't flip out. I used to have a workbench. Hey, what's going on? Welcome. Uh, da, da. All right. So, from what I'm led to believe, this screw right here comes out. We're also gonna do uh, some Dean's connections too, and I'm gonna get rid of this fuse. So I'll show you how to uh, solder as well. There is music in the uh, autofocus. Might need to come off. Yeah. All right, let me see. Sorry about this. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Configure. Stinking autofocus. There you are. All right, so autofocus is off. Hopefully you don't get a headache. I'll keep it up so I can change the focus if need be. All right. So sorry about that. Growing pains on the old uh, drive safe. Growing pains on the old craft stream here. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna take this barrel off to make it a little less unwieldy. And uh, the dog is gonna come off my lap because he wants to get off my lap. So that's that. All right. So to take the barrel off, you gotta take this little block right here off. So it's like a lug. You gotta take it and turn it, and on the other side it'll unlock and you can slide it out on the screw side right there. And then the whole barrel will come right off. So the whole outer barrel and the inner barrel assembly. So I'm just gonna throw that on the floor for now. Hopefully the dog doesn't get into too much mischief while he's down there as well. So that should be a little easier to handle this thing now since it's uh this thing's very heavy it's like 20 something pounds i hear they're really nice though so can't wait to actually get a chance to uh to use it all right so i think where's the other screw that's oh, probably this one Yep, alright, so it's this screw over here by this little feed ramp. 
and then it's the screw that is inside the charging handle. I think that's it. I think it's just two screws, which is pretty crazy. How few, yep, just two. And just like the M60, the uh, wiring comes out easily. It's like a quick disconnect. All right, what are you looking for, buddy? So I've never seen one of these apart before. Um, I've never seen that. That's pretty <laughs> crazy. It looks like they just welded a capacitor or something to it for the trigger. But this looks like it'll be a pretty easy thing to deal with. Mostly saw boxes are always super easy. Yes, PKM super heavy. I had that 60 super light because uh, I took literally everything off of it. Because who's using iron sights with these things anyway? All right, so before I get ahead of myself, so to release the uh, spring and the spring guide, what you want to do is you want to put pressure on this and then push this quick release towards the rear, and that's going to release the spring guide. And you can set it, and then uh, if you keep that out of the way, the spring will come out. And that's a lot of the hard stuff as far as uh, dealing with normal gearboxes is uh, just dealing with all the springs and stuff. So another thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to get these wires out of the way on the uh, motor. So we'll just pull those off right now. You always wanna be super gentle with these because if you break them, life gets annoying. The tabs or the quick disconnects. If you have the choice to break one or the other, break the quick disconnects because those are easy to replace. You break the tabs on the motor and you're basically SOL. That uh, is super hard to replace. Like you just, you can't really, you'd have to replace the, the back end of it. And most of these motors aren't meant to be taken apart. So you're gonna need a metric Allen wrench set uh, for most of this stuff. I think that's more or less all you're really gonna be using as far as tools are concerned. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut that zip tie, aren't I? Yep. So this zip tie right over here, I'm going to have to cut it as well. But yeah, I heard this uh, I heard this thing's going to be pretty bananas, so I'm willing to lug the weight if it's willing to uh, pull its weight. And I got um, two box mags for it too. The box mags are actually pretty well designed. You got the... Um, you don't have to deal with any of those crazy springs or anything. And it seems like a pretty clever... Uh, set up with the quick disconnect and you can put the battery in there so it's got everything everything you want really it doesn't really move the outsides metal and not like stupid metal like it's either steel or aluminum it's like pretty good stuff so it should be strong for its weight my chroma key is kind of jacked up sorry guys And the dog's asleep. Cool. All right. It's going to make life a lot easier. So usually I'll just take all these apart. If you want, you can take um, like a little solo cup or something. And you can put all your screws and stuff in there so you don't lose them. That's pretty uh, pretty good idea. If you drop stuff like I do, which is all the time. But I didn't really prepare for that. So we're just going to wing it. I was running late, so I didn't really get a chance to uh, prepare as much as I was going to. So the parts that we're going to be using for this, um, there's some parts that I've never used before. Um, so I don't know how well they're going to perform, but I mean, if it's anything like all the old stuff, um, it'll be pretty good. I haven't done um, a lot of airsmithing, so it's used to... So airsoft and airsmithing is how I used to pay my bills a long time ago before I started doing other stuff. I got sick of the whole airsmithing thing. Um, so as an adult, you know, you got to do a lot of airsmithing to pay your bills. And that's all I did really to pay them. So I have a lot of experience with a lot of stuff, <clears throat> parts specifically, but um, I've never used one of these. It's a Godzilla 5000. I know this is a long motor, so I'm going to have to um, cut it down. 
on the shaft. So I'll show you guys how to do that. I know sometimes the M60s, you gotta cut a custom length motor. So I just bought a long one, just figuring I'd have to cut it anyway. So you gotta use a Dremel for that. I didn't even check to see if this thing has a D pinion. So if the pinion is not a D shaped pinion shaft, then we're out of luck. No, all right, it is, so we're good to go. The magnet on that seems pretty good too, so I have I have high hopes for it. Uh, other things, we got a garter bucking in case we need it. I have Max brand M4 nozzle. It's 22.25 millimeters. Hopefully, it's about the right size. And then I got some, you know, bog standard shims and a Prometheus 120 spring. So if the air seal is as good as I hope it will be, that should get me right about where we want to be FPS wise. And it won't put too much of a strain on everything. Oh, hey buddy, what's up? The dog is alerted. Sorry about the noise. Hey loud boy, come here. Always very excited. I think he thinks mama's home. So once you take all these screws out, you want to leave this one right here because this one um, holds the trigger switch in. This one right here also holds the trigger switch in, but it also holds the um, this part of the shell as well. So you kind of got to live with it coming out. So with anything airsoft, you don't want to force it ever. It should all fit together pretty well and it should all come apart pretty easily as long as you have everything all set. So this is an A and K Raptor motor. I don't know. I should have shot this. Thing. I haven't even connected a battery and shot this thing. I have no clue um, how much upgrading I really needed to do, which is kind of bad on my part. I just assumed, but that's all right. So once you get yourself to this point, you're going to want to take the spring off of the tap it plate so you want to just hold it use something to pull it off and then the piston and tap it plate the whole cylinder assembly will come out straight up and down piston seems all right get some like injection marks and that looks like a normal inform uh, seal is actually really good probably didn't even need to replace it i'll try it with the tap it plate on that's eh, decent. It's not the best. And the gears seem fine. The shimming on them is something I'll have to check. And I'll show you how to check it. It's a lot of um, taking it apart and putting it back together. The shell sides at least. So after that you want to take the anti-reversal latch and the anti-reversal latch spring off. Set that aside so you don't lose it. I'm going to take the motor off. That way I can spin the gears. Yeah, this doesn't seem super great. Looks generic with a uh, sticker on it, so. Da, 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 da. All right, so I'm gonna leave the electrical switch in there. I guess both of these you can keep tight. That's cool. All right, so these two screws right here, you can keep tight and it's not going to mess with anything. All right. So first things first, we're going to just see how this thing's shimmed. So normally what I'll do is I'll keep the spur gear and the sector gear in. And I'll just make sure there's no shims floating around. And I'll close this up. I wonder if I can get a better focus on this. Let's see right now. Nope, oh, that's not good today sunny all right so then what you're gonna want to do is so this is gonna be a bit of a pain because we're gonna have to fish these wires through every time you just want to kind of take it close it up and just hold it tight ish and then what you want to do is you want to look inside of here and see 
how much wiggle room there is. So if you look right here, I don't know how well the camera can pick it up. I got a lot of glare going, sorry. But you can see this moves up a millimeter at least, which isn't great. Uh, we want to keep that still. Same with this. Looks like this is moving a bit too. And then they're moving each other when they move. So <clears throat> big thing is you want this thing to be the same every time. So every rotation you want it to be as similar to the last rotation as possible. That's how you're going to get uh, consistency and that's how you're going to keep it from killing itself or breaking due to uh, normal wear and tear. These things should, you know, in theory, last basically forever as long as you don't get any BB jams because most of the material these things are made out of these days are um, just much better than when I started back in like 2008. Oh, 2007 or 6? It's been a while. I used to play a long time ago. Excuse me. Alright, so I don't have paper towels. Just got this rag right here. So normally you're going to want to wipe all the grease off. It's going to make life a little easier. You just put some grease on after. We don't really need um, really any grease. A very, very minimal amount of it. Because the only things that are interacting or touching anything in this are going to be the shaft right here. That's going to be interacting with the uh, interior of your bearing bushing. And the teeth are going to be interacting with the teeth on the other gear. Nothing else should be touching. You shouldn't be touching the wall of the gearbox. So if you see like circular scratches on the uh, on the gearbox shell anywhere, that's usually a good. Sorry, the dogs are running around. It's usually a good indicator that you know you got it too close. Because when these things get put under tension uh, from the spring and everything, uh, they do tend to twist a little bit, and that's gonna. So if it looks good without um tension chances are it could still twist and dive into the gearbox shell and gouge it up that's why a lot of times you'll you'll hear these really whiny guns they're <clears throat> it's because something's rubbing these are pretty quiet normally all right so now we got that all set So the first thing I usually do is I'll take the spur gear and with the shims that are on it, I'll just put it back on and see kind of where we are. And then I'll take the bevel gear as well and I'll do the same thing. So I didn't check how the bevel gear was yet, so I'm going to check it right now. So when you check it, the final shimming of the bevel gear, it's very important to have the motor there. So you can see how how it all lines up because a lot of the noise is going to come from this bevel gear and the motor interacting because this is the gear that spins the fastest. So this, this gear will spin, you know, probably mm, maybe 80 or 90 times per one revolution of the gun. Well, no. So if the gear ratio is like 16 to 1 or 18 to 1, then so it'll be 18 revolutions of this per one cycle. So that's what the, the gear ratio is. But the this little guy right here, this will revolve more than that. In any case, there's a lot of potential for noise on this bevel gear because it's the one that spins the most. So as you can see, hopefully you can see, this moves around a lot. So the bevel gear is one that you definitely don't want to move. You want it to be right where it wants to be and that's it. So I'm not going to put the spring on for this, for the adjustments. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the spur gear and the bevel gear and the pinion gear on the motor, how they interact. So right here, looking at it, you can see, maybe you can see it. Let's see. All right, right there. That's probably a decent shot if you have the same resolution that I have. 
So if you look right here, you can see the pinion gear is a little low. It's sticking out. So this would be adjusted too loose. So what you would want it to be is you'd want to turn this adjuster right here. And then you want it to be pushed in a little more. So what I'm going to do is instead of that, when I go to put the other motor on, I'm going to just cut it to the size that it needs to be. So that way it can never um, vibrate loose. And then that'll cause uh, additional wear on the gears if it vibrates loose because you get less contact. So there's more force on the parts of the teeth that are interacting. So another thing you want to watch out for is, so when you slide this forward, I don't know if I can get a good view of this for you, but so when this slides forward, what you want is that the motor can slide forward without, yeah, see, so this motor is just too, too short in general. Because when you have it cranked all the way in, these shoulders right here are keeping it from cranking in uh, as far as it needs to. So it's always going to be a little bit loose that because of that, because this shaft is too short. So that's another reason why I got that long motor. But in any case, you want to be able this you want for this motor to move back and forth without moving this up and down. So it, the teeth should inter, uh, should mesh well, but they shouldn't um, tilt this gear when it uh, when you insert it and get it to the right um, adjustment depth. So what you'll see very commonly is you'll put it, you'll push it in, and it won't interact. And then what'll happen is the teeth, right? So imagine my fingers are the teeth of the gears. So you want maximum engagement without offsetting the plane of the, um, the bevel gear. So you need to find the balance of uh, engaging it and having it not move the bevel gear, but loose enough where it's, it's not moving it as well, if that makes any sense. I'm probably explaining this poorly. Um, but you don't want the bevel gear to move, and you don't want it to be putting too much lateral pressure on the gear. You only want the rotational pressure uh, force from this motor to be transferred to this. So you don't want this gear to be imparting pressure downward on the shaft or away from the way that it wants to spin. That makes sense. Probably not. So because this isn't the motor that I'm going to be using, the best bet is to just take the motor that I am going to be using and just do that. So. There's a few tools that you can use to take pinion gears off, but usually your D-shaped ones, right? So if this, if it's shaped, um, the shaft's shaped like a D, you can just take some needle nose pliers and you can take them and you can just lever it against the, the body itself. So in a pinch, say if this, this is supposed to have a grub screw here that's missing. In a print pinch, what you could have did, or what I could have done, is I could have taken that and levered that up a little bit on the shaft and then tightened the grub screw. So that's a way that you can fix this without getting another motor. Um, I have another motor already, so that's what I'm going to be using. So the only difference between a long and a short motor, right, is uh, this shaft right here and then this collar and this spring. So I'm going to be using the spring from the old motor because I don't need to reinvent the wheel there. And then this, this spring is going to be too much for it. So pretty much what you're going to do is you're going to take the, the cutter parts of this and you're going to take it and you're going to wedge it between the collar, this little collar right here and the pinion gear and you just kind of twist, uh, squeeze it. And that should pop it loose to the point where you can take it and just kind of lever it off. This doesn't take a lot of pressure to do. So that's the pinion gear off. They sell like, I don't know, $80, $90 tools, or they used to be that much to do that, but most of the time you don't need to. And then usually this right here comes off very easily. Um, for some reason this one isn't, so we're going to just kind of muscle it off as best we can. This one's got a little bearing in it, so that's pretty cool. So then what we're gonna do 
Um, I don't have my Dremel set up right now. I should have set it up. That's all right. We'll have time. Bum, bum, bum. So usually what I would do here is I would take my calipers and I would just use this little depth gauge right here and measure how long it is. So these will reciprocate sort of because they're free floating. So you want to make sure that you're not putting any pressure on it because that'll give you a reading that'll be different than what you need. So I'm going to do that and then I'm going to give myself a little bit of extra. So we got four point, so 0.4595 and I'm just going to take it and do that. So what you can do is you can just mark it from there. If you have like a knife or anything, some marker, take it and then just kind of scratch it in. So the hard, hardest part about this whole thing is going to be um, getting this D shape again, but that's still a pretty relatively simple task. So for now, I'm going to put that on hold because the dog's up here still. He barks a lot at the Dremel. He does not like it one bit. So in the meantime, I can do some other things. So normally when I shim, I'll start with the bevel gear and the motor because that's where most of the noise comes from. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do the sector gear and the spur gear. And hopefully I won't need to adjust the spur gear up at all because if I do then I'll have to adjust the uh, bevel gear oh man that, that thing moves a lot I think I took all the shims off that's why hey bud what do you see mm, sorry about that guys I'm just gonna mute the mic for a second so you don't die He seems to have calmed down. In any case, all right, so I'm gonna open up the shims right here. Got these, I think there's two sizes. So there's 0.2 millimeters and 0.1 millimeter. And there's 20 of each. So between all of those, you should have more than enough for, you know, three gears. So I'll take them all out. And they're not marked or any sort of different color, so you kind of just got to grab them and look at the thickness of them, and that's kind of kind of the state of what's going on with that. So I'm going to cut a couple on top. So right now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the play out of it so it doesn't uh, shift up so much. So with the spur gear... And the sector gear, you want uh, as much tooth engagement on this set of teeth with this set of teeth as possible. But you need to not have this face of the gear press up against the face of this gear. Now, if you open a gearbox and you see like spirograph kind of patterns on that, that's what causes that is that this is either tilting on uh, especially if it's only on like one side of it so if it's on one side of it and not the other then what that means is that it tilts when it's under load and it presses against the spur gear which is not good so that's um, I mean it takes a really really long time for any like actual damage to come of just that but what that does is it makes your motor have to work a lot harder because you have to overcome the friction uh, and the spring tension. So that, that ends up making your motor work much harder. It robs you of a lot of performance. All right, so we're gonna set this down together. And then we're gonna see how this looks. 
I really wish there was a good sort of helmet camera setup that I could stream with so that you could see what I see because I think it's really important to know what it, what it is that I'm looking at and sometimes my words are not great so until I uh, possess that manner of technology we're, we're stuck with this all right so I need to take some play out of the top of this a little more and so a good thing to do is you can take this um, spur gear and just spin it real fast and then you can turn it and then you can hear if you um, if the gears are rubbing up against each other in a way <clears throat> like you'll be able to tell if the teeth are scraping against the face So it looks right now like I need to lift up the sector gear just a bit. And then that'll give me enough clearance from the spur gear that I don't have to worry about it tilting and interacting with the face of the sector gear so when you put this together you want there to be a very very small amount of play if you're just holding it with your hands so right about when we're done or we're getting really close to being done shimming it we're gonna put the screws in that are around the gears because that's gonna add more pressure and push the gearbox shell closer together. So that's what happens a lot of times is that people will go and they'll get it and it'll be perfect when it's hand tight. And then you'll put the gearbox shell together and then it'll it'll just perform really poorly because the gears no longer want to spin freely because the shafts are getting um, squished, I guess is the best way to put it. It's just more friction. Friction's bad, you don't want it. So it looks right now like this. I need to put some shims on the tippy top. I can do probably a 0 0.01 on the bottom and then 0 0.02s on the top, or 0.2s rather, on the top. And then this sector gear is probably good because once I screw it in, it'll tighten it up. So we're going to do that. So normally, I would recommend wearing gloves. Um, I forget to put them on. I'm really good about putting them on when I'm uh, doing actual firearm maintenance because uh, lead will seep into your skin through the oil and it will jack you all up. But uh, I'm pretty sure somewhere on these chemicals that are in this, there's a uh, causes cancer in the state of California warning. So repeated exposure to these through the skin is probably not great so I need to get better about that but unfortunately this is just uh, what we got right now all right so we're gonna slide this together does anybody have any questions like general airsmithing questions that I can answer um, just put them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them you can be as specific or as vague as you want. All right, so still need to put some more on the top here. Sector gear might be too tight now. So I'm gonna take one off the top of the sector gear, a really thin one, and I'm gonna put them all on the spur gears. All right, so the thinnest one off the top of the spur. I mean the sector gear, and I'm gonna put it on the top of the spur gear. This is a spur gear, this is sector gear. Spur, sector, in case you didn't know. All right, so I'll put one, two thick boys on there, like the thick relative, I guess. Hey dog. <laughs> so, I, so I use, um some fleece that I got from like Joanne fabric for chroma key and he's just digging all up on like an extra piece that I used to use as a, um, a lap blanket for him. 
so that I could have the gizmo cam. My dog is named Gizmo, by the way. He's a little Yorkie. All right, so this isn't moving, which is good. And it's loose enough where I think, uh, I'm gonna take the thinnest one off of this, off of the top, and I'm gonna put it on the bottom to lift the gear just a touch. And then I'm also gonna take another one of the really thin ones off of the top entirely. And I think that'll get us right about where we wanna be. So one really thin one goes away. The rest of these go on the top. When you're working on these, whenever you're shimming in general, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that the shims always stay on the shafts and not um, on the bushings and they'll have a tendency to want to stay on the bushings so what will happen there is sometimes they'll fall off and you'll undo some work so you want to just be vigilant of that and you want to make sure that you pay attention to where they are so that you don't undo your work and have to redo it plus if they get caught up in the gearbox as well they can cause the gears to stop turning entirely among other annoying things. All right, so. As, um, what do you mean Pop-Tart? Like as uh, far as music, I have um, pretzel rocks on, so it kind of just, it'll say the titles in the, uh, in the chat, cause I have a little bot that'll do that. Are you asking if that's like my player name or? All right, so we got this together now. 54, so you asked that a little while ago. Hopefully you didn't run away before I answered it. All right, so this seems pretty good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tighten this screw down here, this screw over here. And this one up on the spine, and this one on the spine. And then I'm gonna see how it spins. So it should, I mean, there's bearings on these, so they're always gonna spin pretty well. But I wanna see if the faces of these are rubbing against each other. You wanna be very vigilant of uh, making sure that these wires don't get pinched on the parts where there are no clearance on the shell. Because if you pinch your wires, you're going to have to put a new wire in if it pinches it bad enough. Sometimes you can get away with just putting the shield back on. You can just like shrink tube it. But um, other times you're going to have to uh, completely replace the wire. Which is pretty easy on these because it's mostly quick, uh, quick disconnects. But any work that you didn't intend on doing is going to, you know take time away from the stuff that you wanted to do. So on the piston, which is what I think I'm gonna look at next, I need to probably remove the second from the last tooth uh, because I intend on moving the piston back a little bit by putting a, a little rubber pad on the cylinder head and that will make sure that when the sector gear picks it up it transfers the force to the rear of the piston instead of up into the rear so if you ever see a piston where the last tooth got blown off entirely that's because the angle of engagement was poor and eventually okay man be safe at work So, as I was saying, the um, the angle of engagement's wrong and the force, so I need to take the thinnest shim off the tippy top of this one because it's being squeezed. But otherwise, these two are pretty good. So we're almost done with that. This is pretty much gonna be the longest part of the process. That and maybe cutting the um, Cutting the motor. I guess soldering. If 
you want, if you count the time it takes to uh, have the soldering iron warm up. That's usually uh, a thing that takes some time. All right, so. The bevel gear is a pretty quick one to shim. So I'm not really worried about that. Once we get the motor cut to the right size, we'll be pretty good to go. All right, I don't have um, rubbing alcohol, which is something that I should have taken care of. I don't know what happened to it. We used to have some in the house, but it's gone now. So in any case, uh, I need rubbing alcohol to prep the rubber to make sure that when I super glue the rubber pad to the inside of the cylinder head, it adheres the best, <clears throat> like the best that it possibly can. So basically we're gonna take this guy right here, we're gonna cut it, then we're gonna affix it to the back of this and it's gonna thicken it and it's gonna push the piston back to the point where the angle of engagement's right. There's almost no companies that um, have the angle of engagement right out of the factory. I took apart a Crytek once. Um, I've only taken one Crytek apart. I was very impressed with the, the build quality. I, I would say if they're all built the way that that one was, they command, like, they should command the price that they do because they're pretty well put together. Uh, the angle of engagement on it was perfect and the shimming was uh, almost perfect. Like I, I added one teeny tiny shim and honestly it was just me being anal. Like I didn't really need to. All right, so if you look right here is a good perfect example of the angle of engagement being um, difficult. So try to show you with the piston itself so if you look at the profile of these teeth this is tough maybe this one will be better yeah autofocus woo all right so if you look at the profile of these teeth right this one is cut down a little bit um, they did that out of the factory because what ends up happening is the first tooth on the sector gear if um, it picks up this one so what'll end up happening is it'll pull all of these and then it'll release it on this one but there'll still be one more tooth on the sector gear and then what'll happen is it'll push forward and then the next gear will pick it up on this metal gear and that will cause these teeth right here on the outside teeth on the spur gear those will shear so if you ever see excuse me So if you ever see any, um... sorry, my mic was off. Uh, if you ever see any teeth on a spur gear or on a sector gear, hey, thanks for stopping in. I, uh, I appreciate it. Not that this was, you know, super interesting to you if you don't have this hobby, but I still appreciate the lurk. So if you see any of these teeth or the teeth that interact with the um, spur gear to bevel gear, sheared off basically if you see any teeth sheared off of this um that's because you had pre-engagement and then the piston let go and then the spur gear hit it again and that caused it to have like a lot of force go against the teeth and then that something's got to give so a lot of times what will happen is those are under such stress and this tooth is really wide so the gear gives and not the tooth on the piston. Um, it'd be better if the tooth on the piston gave, but that would still be a problem because you wouldn't have, what are you licking buddy? Don't lick anything. There's nothing, nothing for you to lick. Dog. Gizmo's on the lap. Um, yeah, so in any case, to fix that, what we are going to do is I'm going to take a knife and I'm going to cut this tooth off entirely and then we're going to push the piston back a little bit with that pad and uh, I don't have a sharp 
knife, so I think I might just use uh, these trauma shears. Uh, trauma shears are a very good tool to have because they cut everything really well. And they're pretty cheap, so a lot of times you can just work it like that, but that doesn't seem to be working at the moment. <clears throat> Alright, so what I'm going to do is I need to go downstairs and get a razor. Um, so I'm going to put the brake screen on for a minute. I will be right back with a razor and I m I'll take out the, the Dremel, that way we can set it up. Um, so I'll be back in probably two minutes. All right, we're back. So I grabbed a utility knife. You can do this with a Dremel and a fiber wheel as well, but usually this doesn't take a lot of effort. So you can just take the utility knife and just kind of work it a little bit. You always want to cut away from yourself because these knives are obviously super sharp. But you can take off the entire tooth very easily with no need for plugging in a Dremel or anything like that. So that right there, just gonna smooth this out a little bit. Get all the gunk out of there. This song sounds familiar. All right, so that's all done. I'm going to wipe all the little pieces off. So things to watch out for if you do that. Uh, obviously don't cut yourself. And then you want to make sure that you police up all the little pieces of fiber that you make. Because those can get stuck in the teeth of the gears. And cause your gearbox not to turn. Which is a problem. Because if your gears don't turn, your motor is going to do everything it can to try to turn the gears and usually what that involves is <clears throat> drawing a ridiculous amount of current and melting your wires and your battery if you have a, uh, a lithium battery uh, that is very likely to ruin it in one shot 
That's actually why fuses are put in those guns for that reason, because what'll happen is if you have that problem, um, it's not like instant where the problem will happen. The, the problem is if you hold the trigger and you keep providing that current, it will make the fuse pop before everything else gets all jacked up or too damaged. So if you have somebody or you're, you know, you're working on a gun for somebody who may be a little less experienced in how these work, uh, it's usually a really good idea to keep that fuse in. It robs you of performance, definitely, but the trade-off is the likelihood of them breaking their electrical uh, components is greatly reduced. And you really, really don't want the electrical components to break. Alright, so... I'm going to see if I can find... A little bit of maybe engine cleaner or something. Some sort of solvent that I can throw on this real quick. Uh, oh, hand sanitizer would be perfect if I had some. Oh well. I do not have those things. So I'm going to really quickly off camera just hit it with some soap and water. Hopefully you can still hear me. We shall see. So I'm uh, cleaning the the oil off of this rubber. That's the whole point of what I'm doing right now, which is off camera for you know people that are just tuning in. Plus, I'm grabbing uh, a couple like two paper towels to dry this off. All right. Ah, sorry about that. dog is stinking cute all right so <clears throat> I use soap and water because I don't have rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer right now so the best I could do is that rubbing alcohol is really really good for bonding rubber because it cleans it it's what they use in rubber roofing and a lot of other applications for cleaning stuff off of rubber so <laughs> Oh, I guess the dog wants to sit on my lap again. There we go. Hey, buddy. I know. It's an exciting day. Alright, so... <clears throat> they were selling these online. Not these, but they have the, the, the sorbethane pads or whatever the heck they were. Um, a long time ago. For like a freaking two bucks each or something. Just go to Ace Hardware and go to, or, or any um, any home improvement store, and get uh, neoprene washers, right? That's what these are. That's all, as they were selling them for, ridiculous. you get them for 15 cents each, and it is rubber. That's all it is. So, usually what I do is, yeah, I mean, the ones that you get, that um, you pay the money for from the places, they are laser, uh, <clears throat> laser cut, which is pretty nice. A uh, big thing you want to do when you have these is you want to make sure that this hole is going to be the same size as the hole that's existing because that is a, a way that you can lose um, the throughput of your air. But basically, you just get a little washer. Just cut it, man. It's like, it's all it is. It doesn't need to be perfect. As long as it's there and it takes up space, and it's not going to go anywhere. That's, that's literally all you need. So you can see it's not pretty. And I'm not really trying to make it pretty. I just need it to fit and I need it to take up space. And it is going to do both of those things once I do a little more trimming on it. And honestly, there's no difference in the performance that I can tell. And if there is, it's not going to be a difference that you'll be able to tell. Uh, so then you get super glue, right? Super glue is excellent for bonding rubber. And ideally, uh, you're going to want to clamp these together for a minute or two. And then that's all you really need. I like the super glue with the brush 
because then I can uh, apply it evenly and a very thin thin coat because uh, more is worse with super glue so now that I got that brushed on I'm gonna be very careful to line up these holes right and you don't want to touch it with your finger obviously because then it will bond to your skin but once you have it there usually what I do is I'll just take my finger and I'll just press it for like a minute or two it doesn't even need to be that <clears throat> you can just press it for like 30 seconds usually what I'll do is I'll clamp it and then I'll start working on other stuff but I'm not like doing this to make a living anymore so time is not of the essence like it used to be I don't have to knock out like 15 guns in a day it's more of a, a relaxing thing for me these days all right so now that that's on there I'm gonna take the cylinder head reinsert it into the cylinder I'm going to insert these back into the gearbox I'm gonna move the spur gear and I'm gonna have the tap it lug I guess I don't remember what the hell they call it <clears throat> it's the the little nub that sticks out of the sector gear that pulls the tappet plate back I'm gonna get, put that in like a one o'clock position that way the gears don't interfere with the uh, piston so once I know these are in the right position the cylinder and the cylinder head I'm gonna take the piston and I'm gonna push it in as far as it goes and so with the really really soft pads you need to put pressure on this forward pressure because what happens is the the soft pad will shrink or it'll compress when it's under pressure and that will change the angle of engagement from what you think it is to what it'll actually be and it'll be forward a little bit um, this is a, a very it's a pretty hard rubber so it's not going to compress under the kind of pressure that I can or the spring will put it under so then what you do is you rotate it and you want to see how it interacts so the idea is you want the face of this tooth to be as flat with the face of the tooth of the piston as possible so I'm gonna show you with my fingers right because my fingers are bigger and easier to explain so what happens is, let me do it right here. So this, right, this is going to be the last tooth of the piston. This is going to be the first tooth of the sector gear. So what happens car commonly is it'll pick up and it'll be like this. So what that does is that forces the pressure up until it's even, and then it'll force the pressure back. So that upward pressure is what makes the back tooth of the piston come off. So... What we just did is we made sure that the teeth are flat against each other. So what happens is they, they mesh the way that they're intended to, and then all the pressure is going to be back. So that first tooth will take um, the backwards pressure, right? And it's intended to go to the rear. So the pressure will cause the spring to compress. Now the upward pressure on the last tooth has nowhere to go so that's what makes it blow off the back because the piston won't go up and down because of these rails so the piston has these rails on the side right here and then on the side of the gearbox and that makes sure that it, can, it can't rotate so the upward pressure has nowhere to go and it breaks so we made sure that uh, when this gear applies pressure to this tooth it's going to apply it in a direction that it can be relieved and then the other teeth will start to share the load so then the odds of you um, blowing the back tooth of your piston off are basically removed so you can shoot a bajillion rounds out of this thing and as long as you don't get a BB jam that piston is gonna stay fine pretty much forever because these parts are meant to interact with each other and they're not gonna wear <clears throat> so if you do have a BB jam, uh, what 
the, the damage that that causes is this piston can't return forward at full speed. So you'll notice it a lot on your, your higher rate of fire setups that um, you'll have one jam and like, that's it, gun, gun dead. Um, and that's because this can't go forward fast enough. So the sector gear re-engages it at the wrong spot, it completely changes the timing of the gears in the piston. And then that problem that I was talking about with uh, pre-engagement happens and it's either the plastic teeth on the piston that break if you're lucky or it's the teeth on the gears that'll break if you're unlucky. So either way, um, BB jams are just, it doesn't matter how well built the gun is, one BB jam can ruin it as far as uh, an AEG is concerned. Um, I don't know anything about the HPA stuff. I'm sure that it's not going to, like a jam probably won't break it. I don't know how, how all that works, but from my understanding, they're very similar to how paintball guns used to be and jams didn't really break them. They just broke the paintballs. All right. So now we're going to put the nozzle on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to forget the measurement that I had for the motor shaft and I'm just going to measure this nozzle to see what the difference is. So we got, I'll switch it to millimeters. So we got, let's make sure it's zeroed. All right. So it looks like 21.02. And this one is 22.25, depending on how I rotate it. Sometimes it's 2.2 if I put pressure on it. All right, so pretty much what they advertised. So this is slightly longer, which uh, may lead to feeding issues, which is unfortunate. So that is something that I'm gonna have to check to see how this nozzle interacts with this hop up. So that's gonna be a pain in the butt to check out. So if I start having feeding issues, um, the first place I'm gonna look now is this nozzle. And it might be a case of it's a little too long and the BBs can't get in there. So I may have to shave uh, the top of this down, which is actually really difficult to do because you want it to be um, flat. So if you shave it, and it is slightly kilted, what's gonna happen is um, the nozzle transfers the air from the nozzle to the bucking and it makes a temporary connection and it needs to be flush. So if any part of that is open, you're gonna lose air. And at that point, um, a little tiny loss in compression is, uh, is a really big difference. It's like, could be 80 to you know, two, 300 FPS difference. So kind of a big deal that that is the way that it is. So I'm hoping that this isn't too long. If it is, this gearbox is not very hard to take apart. So I will just take it apart and switch it back to the stock one or uh, find another third party one that is a little uh, shorter. So this has two O-rings on the, the inside of it, which is why I selected it because O-rings uh, make for better air seals. Right, which is why we have O-rings on these other things. Oh, looks like it doesn't even fit on the shaft of the cylinder head. That's a bummer. All right, so in case you're wondering, the stock cylinder head does not interact well with the Max. Yeah, it's not even, not even close. All right. So stock cylinder head does not interact well with the max cylinder head uh, nozzle rather. So I'm going to put this on here. I'm gonna see how the air seal is. If the air seal is fine, I'll leave it. Um, if the air seal is bad, then I will change it. So I'm gonna change the O-ring on this, which is a Danco number 14 standard o-ring you can get these at any hardware store or like you know i think this is a 10 pack or something yeah so it's a 10 pack 
it was a dollar or ten. So there's no reason to be spending um, ridiculous money on these parts because they are not expensive and people shouldn't profit off the fact that you don't know that these are commonly available parts. I don't think. Just taking advantage. I don't think taking, adv it, taking advantage of people is um, the right way to conduct business. But that's always been how I have, how, how I have been. All right, so right now I'm putting, um, this is Empire Paintball um, Grease, I guess. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it is very good for um, air seals and O-rings. It is designed for that because that is what you need in a paintball gun is very good air seals. All right, so when you test the compression, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the nozzle is in the extended position because that is the position that it's going to be in when, um, you know, when the shot goes off, it's going to be forward with the BB in front of it. So if you have bad air seal in the forward position, that's when you want to consider changing. This is actually pretty good. Uh, so I'm going to keep this nozzle because most, most, uh, nozzles will have, um, a really good air seal when the nozzle is all the way to the back because you have the back pressure as well. So that's not a good test of whether or not the seal is good. All right, so we're gonna take the whole cylinder piston assembly. We're gonna put it over there. And now I guess we're at the point where we gotta cut that motor shaft. So when you cut the motor shaft, you want to make sure that you cover these uh, cooling air inlets with something. So usually what I do is I will put a paper towel and I'll put the shaft straight through it because this is steel and these are strong magnets. So it's just going to pull it straight in there and it's going to tear them up if you um, don't cover them. So I'm going to measure this again. And I'll have to banish the gizmo off of my lap because I don't want to be cutting steel with him on my lap. Because I'm pretty sure he doesn't want steel bits on him. Alright, so 11.65 is what I want. Alright, so I have marked the shaft already. I'm going to continue, I'm going to deepen that mark a little bit so it's easier for me to find. All right, so I'm going to set this over here. I got the Dremel was set up with the sanding wheel on it. This thing's all, ba all jacked up. So it's kind of a pain in the butt to change these for me because the brake doesn't work anymore because this piece is polymer, which makes it cheaper to manufacture, but then it just doesn't hold up as well. So that kind of sucks. All right, bud, I'm gonna have to set you down because I got to get another uh, pair of needle nose pliers, which I should be able to reach. All right. So I'm gonna use a fiber cutoff wheel for this. So that should be enough. Take that off. It seems fine. Settling in. How long have I been at this? An hour and 12 minutes. Snail's pace. Used to bust through these wicked fast. Wicked fast, dude. Oh gosh. Oh geez, Rick. I don't have my fiber post shaft. So I gotta go get 
that now. I used to have a tool bench where all this stuff was uh, kind of just hanging out. And I recently emptied my room of it because I have a VR set up. And uh, VR is very space, <laughs> very space intensive and super fun. So I kind of just decided to go with that. What's this? There it is. All right. If I was doing this still, I would have invested in much nicer tools by now because I'd be doing these pretty much daily. Alright. So we're going to put the cutoff wheel on there. We're going to cut that. It's going to be a lot of sparks. It's going to be sweet. Oh, cutoff wheel. There you are. You can hear the dog bark because he does not like anything that is a power tool. Alright. I'm going to cover the gearbox with this rag so that I don't get all the steel dust in there. And I need to get some eye protection. Because I don't feel like fishing splinters out of my eye. Uh, I used to have glasses over here. I guess these goggles will work. If I can get them off. Yeah, so we're going to cut that shaft and then we're going to shape it so that it is a D shape. Which is the hardest part of the whole procedure as far as whether or not that motor will work. It's going to really depend on being very gentle with the, uh, the shaping. All right, so that, not the best fit, but we can make do. So there. I want the speed to be high. All right, I'm gonna mute it because uh, power tools are loud. Test, test. All right, so that's probably, put the lock on just so it doesn't turn on by accident. It's the last thing I need is a Dremel running around. All right, and the dog didn't seem to flip out too much. Always a bonus. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna test to see if it's the right length or if we need to cut it again. The uh, shaft gets very hot, the cutoff part of the shaft. Ooh, I came up shy. That's no good. So, she's a little short. And it was already a little short. So that's uh, mildly problematic, but not something that we can't recover from. That just means I'll uh, put a permanent spacer in instead of a, a screw down. Alright, so I need to thin out the D shape of this shaft a little more. I'm going to mute the mic again so you don't have to deal with the high pitch. Maybe if I can find the button. Nope, not that one.
All right, looks like we're in business. So the shaft is good. So now we just need to tighten the scrub screw a bit. And I might actually set a bit of epoxy or actually just super glue would probably be fine on it. And uh, that should hopefully get us there. So I'm going to move this. I'm going to move that back to where it was. I'm going to put that on lock so it does not go off and run around and scare the dog. Hopefully this is a small enough one. It is not. All right, I got a jar full of these things. And I know I have a small enough one in there, so I'll go get it. It is a ridiculously small um, metric Allen key. Like this, this kind that's like only in some sets. And it's never really a kind that you're gonna find in um, like the multi ones, the ones that hold several in the same key. Hey buddy, what's up? Oh, sorry about the dog guys. He gets real grumpy whenever I move stuff. Also sorry about not having that tool on hand. There it is, there you are. one so before I tighten it I'm going to get a little bit of glue on there just for added keeping it in the same spot -edness. but yeah this is this is the one very very small so let's pull the brush out real quick It's very important to wear eye protection when you're doing that sort of stuff because you saw all the sparks all that's all the sparks are um, little pieces of steel coming off and burning in the air so as you can see there's a lot going on there as far as um, debris so definitely wear your uh, personal protective equipment kids all right, so that's there. So that might be the right length, even though I cut the shaft a touch short. Hey, buddy. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to set down the bevel gear, see what it looks like. All right, so I actually need to uh, shorten this a bit. Crazy. So the distance from the shoulder to the shaft might be shorter in this one than um, the one that I started with. All right, so the glue wasn't completely dry, so it was pretty easy to take it off. All right, let's set the let's set the boy down so that he's not getting all sparked up. Get my eye pro again. But cutting, cutting your own length motor for these projects is a huge pain in the butt, but it is ultimately worth it because one of the big problems with saws is that you shoot um, a ton and vibrations make things come loose. Yeah, my hair is funny. now so not bad and we'll see how this fits on this right. can cut this down a little more so I'm gonna make it a, just a bit oops. I'm gonna make it just a bit shorter and then we're gonna be in business Let's mute this again.
All right. This might be it. Boys and girls. Yeah, all right, so that's the perfect size, thankfully. So, let's take this these goggles off. Uh, fix my hair a bit, even though it looks pretty funny. All right, so let's take the shaft off. I hit it with a little bit of glue again. Tighten that, and then that should be perfect for this motor got a little much on there so we're gonna wipe it I'm gonna be very careful if you use super glue on these to not get super glue in the top bearing which I was in danger of for a second there so hey bud what are you looking for I wonder I haven't gotten any on my hand, super glue. Tighten that. All right. So we're gonna put the spring there. Even though we don't really need it, we're still gonna have it there. So then we want to set this down. And then the first thing we check when we're shimming the bevel gear, first off, I'm just gonna take this off because it doesn't need to be there, um, is we wanna make sure that this is the right inserted to the right degree. Hey! Hold on. Let me get the dog so he doesn't bark. Very excited boy, mama's home, so he's gonna be uh, very counter to me doing anything for a little bit. So the first thing you wanna check is to make sure that the motor is inserted to the point that the pinion gear has maximum engagement of the bevel gear. And then the next thing you wanna check is whether or not that is making the bevel gear tilt, which it is. So right off the bat, I know I need to raise my bevel gear up just a little bit, so. I'm gonna go raise it up and then you want to look at it a little difficult you want to look at it from this angle and make sure that it's not going to tilt but you also want to make sure that it's not too high so it's a little bit of a balancing act this is where a lot of your money goes when you're paying somebody to do this because to really do it right it's either going to take a lot of experience which you pay for or a lot of time which you will also pay for so no matter what you're going to be paying for good shimming and honestly it is worth the value it is worth the ticket price because good shimming is going to keep your gun running all right so what we see here is this goes up so we need to put more shims on the tippy top of that gear. So that's what we're gonna do. I put a thick one because it turn uh, it moves a lot. And we're just gonna check again. It's a very time consuming process even if you know what you're doing. Yeah, it takes more time if you're trying to explain it while you're doing it in a way that is concise, which I hope I'm doing an alright job of. Alright, so now it's moving a little bit. I'm going to put two screws in. I think I might actually have just lucked into it being about the right spot right now. So I'm going to put the screws in around the gears and see how it looks with that, because like I said before, the screws in the gearbox apply more pressure. And then another thing that I need to make sure I do right is I have the polarity of the motor correct according to the length of the wires, which it looks like I might have, yeah. 
is the short wire is the red one and the positive connection is facing me so pretty good we might have a working gun soon all right so check that moves just a little so we're gonna turn this I'm gonna put one very very thin one on the top so the point one millimeter one that's what's gonna be on the top and then from there I think our shimming should be if not done good enough And then after that, uh, we're gonna install the barrel and then do the Dean's connectors, well, the Dean's connector and remove the fuse. And that should be it. That's, uh, well, I'll, I'll probably uh, mix the stain and do a quick staining. I won't poly it on stream because I have to wait for the stain to dry before I put the poly on and custom all stain takes time to dry, but um, when you make your own, you make it up. Rude dog sneaking kisses on me. Uh, when you make your own stain, you make it with uh, boiled linseed oil and oil paint. And you mix it, and that's what, and that's basically what stain is. Oh, hello. Thanks for showing up again. Almost done with the uh, shimming. I cut the motor down. So that it can't vibrate loose so it should be the perfect length or very close to the perfect length right now so the less stuff that can vibrate loose the better on saws all right hey buddy hi oh I know I know puppy break all right, so then after that, we're going to change the barrel. I have a, where did it go? 601 that I'm going to put into it. And maybe a bucking if it needs it, but the bucking seems all right. Probably what it'll need is a better nub because it looks like it's uh, an M60 style. caretaker has arrived all right so the dog is out of play you want his uh, food and water too thanks okay Uh, all right, so let's get the spring ready Put the cylinder cylinder head back All that jazz pistons good to go So it's pretty build uh, pretty good build quality on these parts So you don't really need to replace a whole lot when you get one of these if you get one of these which is good because they are not cheap But um Seems like you're getting what you pay for, which is not always the case with uh, Airsoft or life in general. So we're gonna set that in, put that there. I'm gonna get the anti-reverse latch, set it up to where it needs to be, because I don't actually need to put the spring in until later because saws are fun. All right, so we set that there. I'll put that to uh, the one o'clock position. Cool. The anti reversal latch isn't fighting me, so this is going to be easy. Then we want to put the spring guide, catch, release, whatever you want to call it, back in there with the spring. should be it guys all right nice and easy saws are very um, beginner friendly to work on which is nice 
These things need a lot of maintenance. Or they can, depending on how you use them. I know a lot of people that are like, you need to buy like six saws if you're gonna be a saw gunner. And there is some wisdom in that. All right, so we're gonna make sure all the shafts and everything line up. The anti-reversal latch I think is the only thing fighting me right now. So I'm gonna get a punch and manipulate that. Oh no, the uh, bevel gear too. Actually all the gear shafts. So this is where our, um, it's really important not to force anything, particularly with uh, bearing bushings because you can break them if you force them the wrong way. So that's lined up. So your best friend when you're lining these up is gonna be a punch or some sort of thing like that. Oh, maybe it's that, yep, that's what it was. So this is the thing that was uh, keeping it from coming together real smooth and then looks like one of these gear shafts is giving me a problem. Spur gear? Oh, it's the anti-reversal latch. The bottom shaft of the anti-reversal latch popped out. So I think I can weasel it in there like this. We shall see. I may just have to take it apart again. It's looking very likely that that is the case. So, I will. Stash. Now playing. Oh, hello. Check out my Twitter. Do you have any firearms? Yeah, I have uh, Phantom. Um, I have cleaned some firearms on uh, stream before. I cleaned. Uh, an AK, a couple of pistols. Did I clean a couple of pistols? Yeah, so any stuff like that. Um, usually I don't do a lot of firearms maintenance because uh, there's not, I don't have a whole lot of um, firearms to begin with. And then my, uh, I don't really go to the range as much as I would like to, so they don't really need a lot of cleaning or maintaining. You just keep them kind of kind of oiled up what you got um, or do you have any any questions on maintaining uh, firearms because I can hopefully answer some for you but yeah I think two two streams ago I, uh, I cleaned um, my AK an AR-15 um, might be it I don't know what else I might have cleaned but those are usually the the ones that are the dirtiest anyway, because they get the most rounds put through them. I think I, I was a 1911, a 9mm one. But I would, um, if I had more time to stream, I would like to make more of that content, because streams, uh, Twitch seems to be lacking that sort of content, which is understandable. People are very um, apprehensive about you know, maybe getting their account banned or whatever, but as long as you don't um, advocate violence or threaten anybody or anything like that, then you're usually uh, well within the terms of service. I've seen people um, actually like be on ranges and shoot stuff like targets and stuff on stream before. So some, uh, some of that content does exist, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, I don't do a lot of builds. Um, I'm not super picky about my firearms. I just want them to work. <laughs> so, um, which I guess, you know, if you're of a like mind, that might be some content that you would enjoy. But yeah, um, mostly just going to do some airsoft stuff pretty soon. I, I might have um, an M4 that I'm building for a friend that I might stream, depending on the time that I have. But yeah, this is a PKM I've been wanting to buy for a long time, and I finally uh, spent the money on it. Because I had an M60 that uh, a friend sold me for very cheap. It was like 
150 bucks, but it was just a giant pile of parts and some of the parts were missing. So I made it work in theory, but then in practice, it did not work very well. The drum mag is the weak point. The, the gearbox is excellent. So I may repurpose it to a PKM style um, because these gearbox look very similar to the M60 ones. I think the only difference really is this right here, which bolts to the outside, which is nice. And then this, so we'll see, or maybe I'll just buy another M60 and use the parts from it. So if what I'm told is true, uh, these are better functionally than the M60s. And that makes me happy because the M60s were good, but they were not perfect. The drum mag is always the weak point, uh, the weak link on these things. All right, so tightening this down. What kind of stuff do you have? Uh, Phantom or hijinks? Phantom hijinks. What do you prefer? Do you um, do you play airsoft too, or are you thinking about it or anything like that? So you, um, you haven't gotten into airsoft at all yet. So what part of, um, what part of the drum jams, um, mustache? Is it just, um, BBs and stuff kind of get stupid or? Yeah, you can get into airsoft pretty cheap, um, depending on, you know, what's, uh, whereabouts do you live? If you don't mind uh, answering phantom mostly weather is a limiting factor as well like if you're in a place that's cold a lot airsoft doesn't work very well at all but anything between like 60 and like 100 oh new jersey yeah i knew a few people from there um that i used to play with on some big national events a long time ago i wonder if they still play um but new jersey should have an airsoft forum if I'm not mistaken, and the community there was actually pretty decent. I remembered they were pretty welcoming. I, I think I was, I think I still, if they still have that forum, um, my name on there would be T0MA70 or Tomato, like it is here. And I have some old, old um, posts on there that might be good. Female adapter for powering the box broke, so I have to get a new connector, and it's a triple wire. I'll send you a picture of the new one. Ah, all right. So the wiring is kind of a, a pain in the butt then. So if you were thinking about getting into airsoft, one of the biggest, um, the best recommendations I can give to you is your goggles that you get or the mask that you get. You want to make sure that it's. Um, very fog resistant so that it has some sort of uh ideally you want passive fog resistance and active um fog resistance so you're gonna want a fan and thermal lenses in there and that is gonna be the best bet because nothing takes you out of a game more than not being able to see like you could have you could not have a gun and still be pretty effective playing airsoft because you know objectives and stuff you can always help you can medic people you can move things around but if you can't see you can't do any of that so i would recommend very highly getting uh, a high quality mask or um a pair of goggles depending on what kind of uh facial and eye protection you require all right so we're gonna get this in there so it's m120 spring so hopefully this should get us around three and change. Yes, definitely spend the money on good goggles. Turbo fans used to be like my favorite thing ever, uh, ESS ones, but their um, their quality slipping lately. I've had a lot of sets of turbo fans just stop working on me for pretty much no reason, uh, and that is annoying. I have the Desert Locust, uh, Revision Desert Locusts. And they make um, 
thermal lenses for those, which is fantastic because the turbo fans do not have thermal lenses and thermal lenses do a lot to prevent fogging. Oh, that's a bummer. The revisions aren't bad. They seem pretty good. The, a lot of the build issues that I've noticed on the, um, the ESSs don't seem to be a problem on the, um, the revision desert locusts. Oh, word, that's what that does. All right, so in case you're wondering, those two screws uh, remove this finned outer barrel from this chamber, I guess you would call it. So it must be this, this one screw. Yeah, so the military um, does not approve of the thermal lenses because uh, they're not clear enough. So they don't like certain tints of lenses as well because it makes it hard to see trip wires and stuff. Hey, thanks for following, I, uh, I appreciate it. So that's why it's so hard to find the um, thermal lenses because they just stopped making them. But the Desert Locusts, I guess, uh, have a, a pretty big airsoft presence. So, and then they make like the Asian fit ones uh, which are like the knockoff ones. So if you got, um, I guess a small face or I don't know, they, they, they are built differently. So they fit on faces differently. So if that's, uh, if that happens to work for you, then, uh, those are actually really, really cheap and you get the fan versions for, uh, a song basically. All right. So the first thing I want to do is Obviously I want to take the spring off so that I don't lose it and then I want the barrel retention clip to come off and then I want to take this o-ring off that retains the adjuster off the back there. Hey thanks for stopping by um, if you want any advice on what's like a decent gun to get for like a beginner um, I'm on Twitter you can shoot me a message there uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have because uh, I have a lot of time playing this and I can give you, I, I'm not going to make any money, so yeah, CMA AK is really good. But in any case, I'll catch you later. Thanks for stopping by. So this bucking was ripped, so it's a good thing I got another one. All right, so we're going to get our, oop. I'm actually um, mustache pretty partial to the G and G combat machines, the Raiders specifically, are very very good guns for the price. Raider actually has one um, that we made years and years ago. We did like pretty much nothing to it, and the thing is bananas still, and they weigh nothing, which is like the best part. Because carrying a heavy gun all day sucks. I mean, they, they uh, you can make them quite high end for very little money. But I mean, they're they're by no means perfect, but there there really isn't a perfect gun. They all have some manner of limitation. All right, so the nub seems uh, pretty legit, so I'm gonna keep that. And. The bucking, thank the lord, is a normal bucking. I remember the saws had different buckings for a little while. So I got a garter black bucking, which are basically my bucking of choice. And now I'm going to hit it with that. And I'm going to Teflon tape it because why not? Got that big old Teflon tape. So the key to Teflon tape and stuff is you want to make sure that you have a, a thin but unbunched layer that's evenly spread. That way it seals because this will seal um, pretty high pressure stuff, but it does not take well to 
any sort of physical contact. So it seals air really well, but it does not hold up against touching. All right, so this seems like it's good. We're gonna insert this back in here. I'm gonna find the top again. Easy way to find the top is just look for this uh, hole. And then when you put it back on, if you do twist it, you want to make sure that you twist it the same way as the Teflon tape is twisted. Otherwise you will uh, mess up the Teflon tape. This is a very tight fit. Actually, I need to take this off. Might need to lube it. Oh, well, yeah. So it might not even need Teflon tape, so I'm just gonna take it off. And then I'm going to use this uh, grease on it, on the bucking, so that we don't damage it on the way in. Alright, so we got, there's that slot. The only problem with Teflon taping it, sometimes you lose the tippy top, or you, you lose the, uh, or I lose physically the top of the, uh, the barrel. Oh yeah, so we just gotta tape this off entirely, because it is interfering. Sometimes with these two cut barrels, you need to trim the bucking shorter. Oh, I don't think that'll be the case with this one. Alright, so that's the bottom. This is the top. Insert that in. Hopefully we don't... Wow. I don't know if we're going to be able to do this uh, without damaging it. Maybe that's why it was ripped to begin with. This is a very, very tight fit. Right, go. Looks like that's working a little better now. All right, so that's set up. Put the retention clip back in. And then once you put the retention clip in, you want to make sure that it actually is retaining. So you just pull back and forth. Oh no. This is not the barrel spring. This is the barrel spring, way big. So I'm gonna have that set right there. I'm gonna put the, the nub in there. We're going to put this the adjuster back. And then the retention O-ring snaps into place. So then what I like to do is I like to look down the barrel and make sure that the adjuster actually works, which it does. And with some of these, you can you can blow down the barrel and see what the seal is like, but because of the nature of this hole, it's very difficult. So I'm just going to hope that the seal is decent. And we're, we'll just go from there. So then we're going to slide this forward to the point that this engages, tighten this in. And that's the barrel change. Cool beans. All right, so I'm going to insert the gearbox back in to the body. So when you insert the gearbox back into the body, with all saws you want to make sure that these wires right here don't get pinched up in the body. So like I was saying before, don't force anything. If it doesn't want to slide right in, you know, back up and try again because the Consequences are not worth the potential time save of forcing it. 
think you gotta go back, back to the front on this. And retract that. All right, cool. So now we gotta line up these holes. Does it not have holes? Does it just hold in by pressure? We'll see. I think these, uh, has to thread into something so it's gotta have a hole to line up with oh there we go all right cool so there's retention holes for these or threaded holes screw these into and then uh watch that let's find the other one another screw there it is All right, after this, I'm gonna, what time is it? Six o'clock. All right, I think I got a minute. Uh, I will put the barrel back in. Green screen, green screen game, not on fleek. All right, we're gonna put this locking lug thing back in. So that slides in. Should have had a camera for my lap because that's really where most of the work gets done, sitting on your lap when you have like the full gun. All right, twist that, make sure it doesn't come out anymore. All right, I'll set this down. Actually, no, we'll do the Dean's connectors right now. And my headset is dying, so that means my microphone is dying, which is not a good feel, but that's all right. If it dies, I think I had a decent showing as far as the stream is concerned. So, soldering a Dean's connector, um, the biggest thing that's gonna give you a hard time is if your soldering iron is not good. So I have a uh, 40 watt, is it? Yeah, 40 watt Weller, right? Things cheap, but it gets hot enough to do soldering for this kind of soldering. So that's pretty much just what we need. So a lot of it comes down to prep. So the difficulties that you're gonna have are gonna come down to whether or not you prepped well or not. So we need to strip this. Shrink tubing, I'm gonna use this knife. Cut this open. The wires seem pretty decent, so that's good. So while that's warming up, I'll do all the all the stuff that I need to do. So where a lot of people go wrong with soldering Dean's connectors is they either don't have a soldering iron that gets hot enough or they just don't have the patience so they just don't quite understand how it works so the whole point of it is you need to heat the wire up to the point that the solder melts on the wire doesn't matter if it melts onto the soldering iron what matters is if it melts onto the wire so when you have um, braided wire you want to twist it together and you get yourself some shrink tubing. And once you make the connection, and then I'm gonna get my heat gun so that we can make the shrink tubing shrink in a way that is uh, gonna work out and look pretty. So once your solder, your soldering iron is hot enough to melt solder, like quickly, then that's when you're hot enough to do the thing. So usually what I'll do is, it's a thing called tinning. So I'm gonna take 
the wire. I'm going to set the soldering iron on it. And then I'm going to press the solder into the wire. So see how it's not really melting right now? That means my soldering iron is not um, hot enough yet. So it takes longer to heat the wire. So once it gets hot enough that it'll actually melt to the wire, then you're good. You should have iPro on because you really don't want splashing solder in your eye. All right, so now we're gonna do this one. This obviously gets very hot. So you want to not burn yourself. Don't touch the wire once you soldered it. So any excess solder you want to kind of gently flick off so you don't splash it everywhere. No, I, uh, I have other things that I gotta do so I can't go to a uh, wasteland. It would be great if I could. All right, so now the Dean's connector, right? Or a T connector, depending on, you know, copyrights. So the top of the T is always positive. And you always put male uh, connectors, sorry. You always put male connectors on the guns because if you put male connectors on the uh, batteries, if they touch anything metal, they're short out and catch fire and stuff. So you don't want that. So press that against your soldering iron so that the surface gets hot, melt it to that. And usually I'll just drop it and that'll get the excess off. And I'll do the same with the negative. And I drop it, gets the excess off. So now everything's all tinned up. So now you're about ready to do your thing. So that's all the prep work. You wanna get your shrink tubing on before you solder. So that way, once you do solder, you're good to go. So I'm gonna cut this a little shorter. Actually, no, I should be fine with just that. No, I cut it. So we're gonna cut this a little short. All right, so usually I do positive first. So what you wanna do is you wanna take it, you wanna line it up like, like so. Oop, just touch that quite hot. So you want to get it all lined up. And then you want to get a pair of needle nose pliers. The smaller ones are usually better, but I have these really chunky ones that I've been using forever. And you usually want to use the small ones because they sink. Um, so metal sinks heat. So you don't want this, the heat to sink into the pliers. You want it to go into the wire. Um, but this one works. So once you get it, um, squeeze the absolute crap out of it and then you should just press the soldering iron to it and then you'll feel it melt together. It takes that long. Like it's very, very quick. Um, and then what will happen is you have this uh, very strong connection that um, the wire itself will break before the connection. So it's a chemically bonded in a way that's stronger than um, the wire is on its own. So then you just hit it with a heat gun. Shrink the tube. Chef fingers. Looks killer. All right. So we're going to cut that one. And then we do the same thing. When I was doing this, uh, when I was doing airsmithing for a living, I made a ton of money on Dean's connectors because uh, I was good at it. I was fast at it. And uh, Dean's connectors are super cheap. So basically what I did was I charged $5 a connector and I cleaned up because honestly each connector is probably like 40 cents. So really you're just paying for my solder and my time and because I can do it so fast I can charge a reasonable rate and people will pay it because I do a good job. Alright, so heat, heat shrink that mo. All right, that's all that. So we're gonna get rid of this fuse. So the first thing you want, you wanna absolutely make sure that <laughs> before you get rid of the fuse, that the wire um, will still be long enough to work. So because there's all this extra wire, 
This will or should still work. The short part right here is going to be kind of difficult. <clears throat> it's going to be what makes this difficult. So we're going to cut this. Cut that right here. Those trauma shears are great and they cut through everything. So when you do the wires together, uh, depending on how neat you have to be, you don't really have to do any tinning. Uh, mostly what I do is I just twist it together and then just solder it. And then once you melt the solder to the wire, that's it. They're connected. They are never coming apart. Alright, so we got this right here. It's also very important to make sure that you get the shrink tube ready to go before you solder it, because then you'll have to un like you'll have to desolder it, which is uh, depending on how well you did, could be a massive pain in the butt. So now that that's all together, hit this with the solder real quick. Same thing here. I'm melting the solder on the wire, not on the soldering iron. All right, so now that that's all set, I'm gonna unplug my soldering iron so as uh, to not cause a fire, if I can reach the damn thing. All right, set that down. And then I'm gonna get some needle nose pliers. I'm just gonna squeeze the wire so that it's flat. I can get the shrink tube around it because uh, one disadvantage of soldering is that that wire is not flexible at all in that one spot anymore so usually it's not a big deal but it can create issues in certain situations alright so I had to stretch that a little bit to get it over so get this over and hit it with the heat gun. Be real careful with the heat gun because this will um, melt and boil and do all sorts of really terrible stuff to your other um, wire jackets. All right, so that's that. Uh, let's see if I got a battery here. We can give this thing a, a test spin, see what it sounds like. And then I will show you how to mix up some stain and apply uh, the very first very light coat of stain. All right, there's a safety on this thing right here. Not terrible. So from what I understand, there's a rate of fire control. Asking for a friend. What's the advantages of Dean over uh, Tamia? All right, so. Dean's connectors have um, less resistance than um, a Tamiya connector. So a uh, Tamiya connector, ha it'll only let like, um, I think it's like 10 amps through or something. And a Dean's connector has less resistance than the wire itself. So it's like having no connector. So you're not losing anything. Not bad. The uh, rate of fire isn't nearly as high as I would like it to be, but that'll do. As long as it can, uh, as long as it'll keep shooting and it'll wind, it's actually not the worst. All right, so I'll set this down. Now I got that. So for this, I am absolutely gonna get gloves and put them on because I do not want purple hands. But stain is uh, very, very quick to apply. Um, dangers of boiled linseed oil is, um, so you ever maybe heard of oil soaked rags uh, spontaneously combusting? Well, they a lot of times were soaked in boiled linseed oil. So that being said, um, 
any rags that you create with this should be stored in an airtight fireproof container or disposed of in the proper manner probably in a fire pit at some point just whatever won't cause your house to burn down so you can just take a little cup like this cut it so it's a little easier to work with you can always use a like a foam brush or something too to apply it but I uh, I always like the rag for applying stain back when I used to work construction I would stain trim with uh, a rag it just works for me opens. yep so it'll just pry off so you want a little bit of this oil And then you any any oil based paint, right? This is basically all stain is. So it's an oil based paint that's cut very thin with linseed oil. That's it. That's all. That's all that stain is really. So now I just need like a stick or something. Just mix it up, you know, and, and uh, the color that you want, you know, you're gonna have to play around with the proportions. I want my uh, purple to be very purple, which is why I used a lot of paint. Honestly, you don't even really need the linseed oil. You could just do like if you if you want a very like brilliant like. Um, a very dark color you can just use the paint and it will work just fine so that would uh, you know kind of remove the need for disposing of a rag properly but all you do take this give it a little dip just rub it right on that's all it takes that thing is gonna be purple it's gonna look sweet so it's always it always starts darker than it does when it dries and it takes days to dry because it's oil paint the linseed oil kind of helps it dry faster too so there's that aspect to it and then you just want to just you know a little bit will go a really long way so you don't want to go too crazy with it you just kind of work it into the wood and that's that so I'm just gonna keep doing that until I got it all covered and sometimes you want to put a couple coats on you know once it dries it might not be completely even and that's when you would reapply some I feel like Bob Ross this is a happy little PKM right here mm -hmm. I'm gonna go beat the devil out of it later so you can see how like light that is compared to that and it's probably gonna dry lighter than that so the um, you know, the more paint that you use the darker it will be you don't want to go too crazy with the darkness though because what will end up happening is it will like you won't really be able to tell what color it is if you're doing like a crazy color like mine okay. Okay, so now we're just gonna wipe the excess off obviously the rag is gonna be ruined like, you're not going to really be able to use it for anything else after this. Because it's a, uh, a genuine and legitimate fire hazard. And then after this, um, once it dries, you know, you, uh, you should put 
some sort of clear coating on it to uh, protect it. from scratching off and other things. It also protects you because uh, this takes uh, such a long time to dry that what ends up happening is um, this will stain you if you and your clothing if you don't um, you know seal it with something. So that's that. I'll wipe this one up. As you can see, it's a very fast process. Does not need to take a long time. Pretty sure that the stock stuff that they used, like the, so how this came from the factory, they probably just went, <laughs> dipped it in, and then the, there was so much clear coat on it. It was actually kind of a shame. The uh, the finish that came on the wood on this was actually quite nice. So um, if I didn't want it to be purple, I would have been very happy with the finish that it came with. But purple, haha. -ha. Also, not on this stream because I can't spray paint in the house. Um, I'm going to be painting my drum mag a uh, color of purple that my M60 used to be. But that's the uh, pistol grip. And then we're going to get the stock going right after this. But you absolutely want to be wearing gloves when you're doing this because there is no way you're not going to stain your hand and honestly you should be wearing clothes that you don't care about which uh i kind of like this shirt a lot so that's why i'm <laughs> leaning in more also i want it to be on camera so that's another reason and, and i'm gonna i'm not going to reassemble the pkm with the the wood for you know obvious reasons But that's, uh, that's pretty much it, man. This is super custom now, as far as like the way that it looks. You know, nobody is gonna nobody's gonna mistake my PKM for somebody else's, cause this thing is gonna be purple as hell. All right, now the stock. This stock was a huge, huge pain in the ass to sand took so long I was covered in sawdust but it's super cool looking oh yeah what color are you gonna what color are you gonna make it mustache the thing is you got to sand it down well do you have a is yours wood or is it the synthetic one Honestly, I wanted the synthetic one, but it was like way more money for it. And I was like, ah, I don't know. It was like another 40 bucks for the synthetic stock. Yeah, I like the synthetic would have been cool. So one thing that kind of stinks is there's a hollow right here and there's a teeny little hole when I sanded it that it kind of wore through. It's not really going to affect anything because the stock is all like really solid otherwise. But it's still kind of a bummer. All right, so need to make a little bit more of this. Yeah, painting, uh, painting that PKM would probably look super cool. Those PKMs look super cool. Hey, you can't do purple, son. Trademark. That's me. Do like a, like a powder blue. That'd look pretty rad. I'd like to see that all brought back. Beacon made Raider paint his uh, little lulzy pinky purple camouflage gun back to like a normal color, I think. Or no, um, I think Raider's brother painted it and then he wanted to paint it back, but then Beacon was like, no, you can't, you can't do that cool stuff. Through my XO, to which I would have been like, eat a dick. 
Oh, yeah, do it anyway. He's not your real dad. He's not your supervisor. Have fun, man. I'm, I'm gonna go and get those bike horns. Uh, I'm gonna try to order more. Oh, you didn't see it, because you weren't at the training. But yeah, that bi those bike horns, it's three for 10 bucks, right? They're like just pathetic enough that it's super hilarious, but they're definitely loud enough to be like um, a, a really big distraction slash I didn't see anybody who heard it and didn't like immediately just laugh a lot. So the honking, yes. I want people to run away from the honkings. Like I want to initiate some pretty bad pretty brutal ambushes with the uh, the bike horn. That way they like they'll be walking down the street and somebody like ring a will honk a bike horn and they'll be like ah! <laughs> they'll have uh, airsoft PTSD. But that's the plan, because, yep, if something is really wimpy and you can get people to, like, run away from it, that's, like, a super win in my book. That is the best possible outcome, which is part of the reason why my name is Tomato, because Tomato is uh, not an intimidating name whatsoever. But if I can make people fear that name, you know it's legit. It's not like, oh, that's Iceman, you know, ooh, he's scary, or some like ridiculous name like that. Yeah, that's a good stock. That actually took a lot of effort to, to carve that in and have it look good. Good old RPK stock. Oh yeah, look at that, that looks legit. I'm going to get a, a sweet clear coat on that, and it's going to look awesome. I'm very pleased with how this turned out. It'll be a little lighter, but that's, uh, that's a goodie, boys. All right, now let's take this off. All right, so that's, uh, that's pretty much going to be it for my stream today. Uh, are there, oh, I still stained my wrist a little bit. Any, uh, questions, comments, concerns, stuff you'd like to see in the future, um, let me know. If, uh, you've been lurking, I, I appreciate the lurk. Um, if you could shoot me a follow, that would help me out a lot too. I'm trying to get to be affiliate status at some point. I think it would be really cool to, um, maybe make a little bit of money doing this or at the very least have my own emotes and be able to make the stream a little better in that sense um yeah follow me on twitter i'm pretty rad i have uh two facebook pages one is uh tomato so t0ma70 that covers mostly my video game stuff and then i have uh tomato airsoft so t0ma70 <laughs> yeah, that, that would be good. I could do those. So, uh, T0MA70 Airsoft on Facebook. I, I post up some projects on there. Um, I have a Discord, but nobody's really on it, and I don't really fill it with content because I don't really have the time. And I don't like Discord as much on my phone. But I do like Discord anyway. So, that's, uh, that's it. So, thanks for stopping in. I tried record this but Nvidia couldn't get their shit together as far as uh, drivers are concerned so I'm gonna try to download this from Twitch and put it up on my YouTube page I do have a lot of stuff on YouTube um, so if you look me up it's just t0ma70 you'll notice the icon it's a tomato I have an old one that has some like old ass like counter-strike 1.5 videos uh, that's super rad so there's like three videos on it and it's 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 worth a watch because I was awesome at that game. But, um, yeah, thanks for stopping by, and uh, I'll catch you guys next time.